Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our first ever UCAS Parents Live Meet um, via Facebook. Uh, we've never tried a training session like this before. Normally about now we'd be in the common room. We do it at the end of June, start of July, and uh, run through with parents uh, the whole university application process. But uh, we're going to try it online. Um, we're hoping to fit it into about 30 minutes so that some who are running on lunch breaks can fit it in there. Others will be at home. Um, the idea is that you can post questions as we go along and because this is a recording it means I can respond to them quickly we can get it all done um, simultaneously that's the plan so feel free to put your questions in. Um, I've also run the first session for students um, which was what goes into the application form. I'll be running another workshop for students about personal statements and um, there'll be uh, a, se a session in April 2021 about student finance we're a long way away from that. Um, two seminars today, one um, by Mrs. Rust Ashford about how much does university cost. We recognise it is a significant investment. Um, Mrs. Rust Ashford's had three children go through university, so she understands the process of applying for finance, but also actually how much support do students really need. And um, she's done a brilliant session and given you lots of detail there. And then I'm going to run through the application process, our deadlines, what the form, form looks like and how you can support. So that's the plan. Um, I'm a, just to say I'm a massive advocate of going to university. I was the first generation in our family to go to university. Admittedly, it wasn't as expensive back then. Um, but in terms of social opportunities and jobs and salaries, there's loads of reading, loads of research out there just to say, um, you know, give university serious consideration. Don't be put off. It is for your son, your daughter. Um, it is accessible. It can be done. Um, the other thing I think to mention is that there is a lot of uncertainty around university at the moment with um, universities potentially phasing students back in in September. They don't know what's going on at this point in time. And what I would anticipate is potentially next year, 2021 application, there will be a spike in applications, I think, because a lot of students have decided not to apply this year from overseas. So they'll be delayed into the 2021 cycle. A lot of our students this year who were going to go in the 2020 cycle are also talking about um, applying into the next year's cycle. So we really want to get a good quality application in. Universities will still, of course, be wanting um, students to come and join them, but we just need to make sure we've got decent applications in and prompt applications in. Right, at this point then, I'm going to hand over to Mrs Rust Ashford. Uh, she's going to go through how much universities cost and then I'll come back on and do how do you support the application process. As I said, feel free, free to post questions at any point. Thank you. Hi, 12s. I'm here to talk to you about the cost of going to university. So having put three children through university myself, hopefully I'll be able to give you a good view on what the total and actual cost is of going to university and hopefully um, you'll see that it's worthwhile. So I'm just going to switch over to our point. Hopefully you can see that. So what's the cost of going to university? Um, so the cost that you'll need to consider can be split into two different areas, I suppose. You've got your tuition fees, which you pay to the university. This will be repayment, which is spread over a long period of time through student loans. And then you've got living costs. Some of those are spread over time through your student loan. Some, however, are immediate expenditure. So we'll talk through the different types. So starting with tuition fees, all universities in the UK can charge up to £9,250 per year. And for that, you get all your lectures, tutorials, the use of the libraries and computers and any other university facilities. There are some things that it doesn't include, which we'll talk about later. Um, this is paid direct to the university via a tuition fee loan from... Um, Student Finance England, everyone is entitled to that fee money. Um, so no money is paid up front. It's all paid for by the loan and it's all gone, goes direct to the university. Um, and that's arranged through Student Finance England. 
Some courses have do have lower fees, like foundation degrees and open university courses, which you might want to consider. Um, some degree courses are run by independent organisations, particularly um, some performing arts colleges, um, and they are not uh, they have no entitlement for student loans. But usually, if that's the case, they offer some kind of scholarships for gifted students or bursaries. Um, occasionally, at some arts colleges, they require you to do a foundation year um, to prepare you for the degree course in your chosen art. And those foundation years are not covered. But that's those are quite unusual situations. Um, so that's tuition fees. And then... Uh, moving on to living costs. So if you choose to move away to university, you might choose to go to a university where you are able to live at home. Um, but if not, then you'll be entitled to maintenance loans either way. Um, it'll just be less if you decide to go to a university where you're living at home. If you decide to move away, then your maintenance loan could be anything up to £9,203. It's a bit of an odd figure, I know, but that's the maximum, um, which is dependent on your household income. That maintenance loan would be paid directly to your account, to you from Student Finance England. And then from that, you have to manage all your living costs. Um, as I said, it's dependent on your household income. So that is the maximum that you could get. It could be a lot less. And that repayment is the same as your tuition fee loan. It's repayment spread over years. So um, moving on to living costs, accommodation, important, lots of questions that students usually ask about accommodation. Um, this can be split into halls of residence, um, arranged by the university or private rented accommodation. Um, for halls of residence, which I would recommend, especially in first year, because you would be very isolated um, and there are some difficulties that can crop up with private rented accommodation, um, you would be very wise to go for halls of residence, although sometimes it can be more expensive. Um, the average cost in the UK for halls of residence rooms is 4900 but it varies hugely depending on your location and the quality of the accommodation that you select. It could be anywhere between £3,000 and £6,000. Um, if you choose to live somewhere expensive, it could be at the upper end of that. Um, but it does include all your bills and internet access. Um, it does sometimes include catering. So if you were at the upper end of that cost, it could be that you've chosen halls where some catering is included. Um, on campus rooms, rooms that are very convenient for the university tend to be more expensive. Others in cities are kind of dotted around the city. Um, that's up to you to kind of research cost versus convenience, niceness of the rooms and so on. Um, so more on accommodation, private accommodation which is a private rental can sometimes be cheaper it might be something you consider in second year or third year um, but consider that you may have to pay a higher deposit to secure that accommodation which is an upfront cost um, it's often that you have to pay a full year's rent in halls of residence you only have to pay for 39 weeks the time that you're there you don't pay for the accommodation over the summer which is better um, although some people like to stay where they are for the summer and don't want to come home. So then um, you might want a full year's rental. Um, that doesn't include things like bills, Internet. Sometimes you might have to manage this yourself, which can be tricky when there's several people living in the same house. Um, there are no wardens keeping an eye out with um, security. So it's probably not as secure as living in halls of residence. So the initial spend to go to university, here's what you need to consider. Um, so most halls of residence will ask you for a deposit to secure the room. This might You might be asked for this even before you know whether or not 
you're going to be going to that university just to secure um, the room that you require. So that ranges from about 200 to 300 pounds. It would be more if you went for private accommodation. Um, that usually comes off your first accommodation bill. So it's, it, is a, um, it is a deposit. It comes off the bill. So effectively, you get that back. Um, you will need to fork out initially for some living equipment. So you'll need kitchen stuff like crockery, plates, cups, um, probably best to go for two of each so that you can have a guest if, if required. Some cutlery, cooking utensils, pots and pans. Um, don't buy absolutely everything because other people in your flat will bring things as well. So good idea to try and get in touch with them before you actually go. Probably in August um, is the best time to buy these things. Don't buy it all too soon. Universities normally put people in flats in touch with each other. So contact them, ask them, are you buying a frying pan? Are you buying a kettle? Kettles and, and microwaves are normally provided. You'll need bedding, you'll need towels. Um, you'll need your own supply of toilet roll, which you hide in your room. Otherwise, other people will steal it. Um, the cost of this, uh, in my experience, to if you go to Wilco's or somewhere like that, um, you can get all of those things approximately £150, depending on you know the, what you choose to buy. You might choose to buy some luxury items like a rug or a lamp or something. You don't need those things. Um, you will probably want to take a laptop. Universities have computers um, and 24-hour opening libraries. Um, so it's not absolutely essential um, but you may want to work in your room. Um, a Chromebook like you've been given at school, a brand new Chromebook is around about £200. Um, a lot of the universities use Google Classroom and um, Google Drive now, so that would probably be quite handy. But that would be the minimum cost. OK, so day to day. Um, you will be looking at things like books, stationery, on, you know, which is ongoing, um, laptop I've already mentioned. There might be field trips depending on your course um, and there might be some equipment that you need to buy for your course which is not included. Um, that would It should be given on the website if there is anything like that, especially field trips which are compulsory but not the cost of them is not included in the fees. Um, food and toiletries... My reckoning is approximately you need £30 a week, um, which will come out of your maintenance loan. Depending on your household income, it's possible that your maintenance loan might not might only cover your accommodation. And then your parents need to supplement you for your actual day to day cost of living. So because it's dependent on household income, they assume that if your parents' income is higher, that they will be able to um, support you in that way. Um, social, I've put £20 a week. You've got to be careful with that because you'll have people saying, let's go to the pub for a drink all the time. Um, that can become really costly. Travel, um, most people at university don't have cars. Most people walk to and from university um, but traveling trips to home on the train could be quite costly for return tickets and things like that. Um, you'll need a phone and a phone contract. Um, my reckoning is all of that in total, about £70 a week is usually just about enough. OK, so um, I've written down here some hidden costs from experience. Um, that you might not see coming up straight away. Some courses require you to buy some equipment, which is an upfront cost. Um, if you're doing a, a medical degree, for example, a paramedic or nursing or something, they might require you to buy a stethoscope, for example, or um, for some science subject, safety goggles. Um, or for my son who did geology, he had to buy a rock hammer. Um, 
him particularly who did um, geology, there were quite a few field trips um, that they were told were compulsory, but they were not included in the fees. So we had to pay for some of the costs. Um, some of it was included, like travel, but spending money, other costs were not included. This should be on the website if there are things like that on the course, but it is a cost that you would need to consider. Um, alcohol, as I've already mentioned, drink it wisely. Think about the money and your liver. Um, parking. A lot of cities will have restrictions where you can't actually park near your halls of residence or near the university. Um, you might have to park away somewhere and then that might cost. You might need a permit to park near where you live. Some universities don't even allow cars on campus. Um, or in the case of Oxford Brooks, for example, um, they don't allow students to, to have cars in the town of Oxford at all because there are so many university students there it would be overrun with cars and they have nowhere to park them. Um, so that's something else to consider. Um, trips home can be costly if you're taking the train. And another little surprise one was a key fob to get into your halls of residence. They sometimes ask for a £10 deposit for the key. Um, OK, so let's total all that up. The total cost and how it is repaid. So over a three year degree, um, each year you'll be applying for student finance separately. You don't just apply for, for your student finance at the start of your degree. You apply for it each year that comes up for what you need. So you have a tuition fee loan. Um, so three times £9,250. The total cost will be £27,750. Sounds like a lot, but wait maintenance loan if you had the maximum say um the nine thousand two hundred and three pounds then over the three years that'll be twenty seven thousand six hundred nine pounds um don't forget the extras that i've already mentioned the upfront costs of buying the things that you need to move away kitchen equipment laptops etc um so the total of all that fifty five thousand three hundred and fifty nine pounds that is a lot of money. And then the interest that is charged on that whilst you are studying and until um, you've completely repaid the loan currently is 5.4%. Um, so that means that percentage each year is added on to your debt. Okay, so you might be thinking now, well, how does it ever get repaid? Well, it does. Um, Repayment starts when you earn over £26,576, um, which is quite a respectable salary. Um, so here's an example. Um, your, if your monthly income is £2,400, pretty respectable, um, that means your income will be £186 over the monthly threshold for repayment. Um, so I think that's a, about an annual salary of £28,000, um, which is, you know, a, a, good, a good earnings. Um, so breaking it down monthly, so your £2,400 monthly income, that means you're £186 over that threshold for repayment. So that means that you'll pay back 9% of that amount that you are over. So 9% of £186 each month. That equates to £16. So your monthly income is £2,400. And the amount of student loan that you'll be paying off that month is £16. So it's really not that scary at all. It's very similar, really, to a small increase in income tax. Hence, sometimes the term that Mr. Bowson used before, graduate tax. So whilst that amount of money does look pretty terrifying, at the same time, you appreciate that the government is meeting um, a lot of that cost initially so that you can go and get that fantastic education um, and have better earning potential in the future. And then you are allowed, even though you're paying interest, 
to pay it back very, very gradually. And it gets completely written off after 30 years if you haven't paid it back by then. So you can think of it as income tax, as a mortgage, whatever you like. OK, so to finish, um, after all of that bad news of all those costs, um, what will the benefits be of your investment? So I'd just like to chip that in because it is an investment um, and there is cost. But at the same time, you get that better progression in your career. Uh, many um, professions now actually need that degree. You can't get into that profession without that degree. Um, nursing, teaching, social work, lots of things. Um, so being able to do those kinds of jobs means that you will end up with better job satisfaction. The rest of your life um, is a lot longer than these three years that you'll be forking out that, that cost. The rest of your life is a long time and you want to enjoy what you're doing. Um, you'll get better pay, most likely. The statistics all support that. You'll gain confidence, you'll gain independence. Um, so think about it, but make a well-informed choice because of the cost. You need to be well-informed about the courses that you're choosing and that your chosen path. OK, thanks for listening. I hope that's been useful to you. Thanks very much. Thank you to Ms. West Ashford there uh, for thinking about through the finance. So it is a big financial commitment and narrowing it down to five choices needs care and attention. I say to the students, if they were to buy a car for 27,000 plus pounds, um, they would certainly do their research. And this, these next steps of applying to university, a lot of it is research. The actual form that students already had access to probably takes an hour to populate that form. It asks for things like personal details, phone numbers, uh, GCSE certificate, uh, GCSE grades, and then towards the end it will then ask for, well, what are your five choices? And you can only make five choices. You don't rank them in any order, but you need to narrow it down to five universities and the course. I'd recommend only one course. In the past, students have tried to say, well, I want to do paramedic and I want to do sport. But you can't write one personal statement for those two different courses because they're so dissimilar. So the point comes where the student just has to get off the fence and say, OK, this is the course I'm going to apply to. And um, they can change that course all the way up through um, the application process. But um, in order to write the personal statement, you have to have a clear idea of the course. So um, here's the uh, role that you can play. So you can play the role of search buddy. Um, this is thinking about um, narrowing it down to those five, being a sounding board for the student. You can read the personal statement and check over that, comes to that in a minute. You can just keep a track on deadlines and I'll go through those. Signposting sources and actually um, it is a long process for the students often. They just need that, that nudge, that encouragement to say, yeah, well, at least you decided not that university or however it might go in your household. So let me just run through some of those roles. The search process, then, I've said to the students in my introduction to them, you should be keeping notes, they should be keeping notes of what they found out through their search process because we've got hours of research going into this. Um, if we can just pin it down onto uh, you know, a, little, a little notebook or something like that, that will really help. And within those notes, it might be start off with well, what's important to you. Do you want to be on a campus? Do you want to be in a city? Do you want to be over three, three hours away? Do you want to be less than three hours away? Um, 
other, other criteria, for example, do you have family around the country you want to be close to? So uh, it, what's important is one thing. Um, within that what's important, I think I've said to the students, you need to have a range of universities that reflect your predictor grades, a student's predictor grades. So for example, if a student's predicted um, three Bs or three Cs or merits, then actually you need to have uh, entry requirements that reflect that at the top end and then at the bottom end um, to be safe as well. Um, the subject guide is quite helpful. I'm just going to show you this on my toolbar here. So within the UCAS.com website at the top left-hand corner there, um, you've got quite a lot of information. This is a brilliant website, by the way, but you've got quite a lot of information within there. Now, if at the top you see where it says undergraduate, um, from within undergraduate, sorry, double click there, um, you're able to look at a bit more information about choosing what and where to study. Within choosing what and where to study, these subject guides are quite useful because students often will say, well, I think I want to do something within sport, or I want to do something within business, or I want to do something within history, um, biology, art, design. Um, these give you more details about what courses are available in there. So I use those subject guides, subject guides on UCAS.com. The league tables, once you narrow it down to a kind of a subject, the league tables are quite useful because they can actually be a starting point for looking at uh, which universities are better at that. So the complete university guide, you see at the top there, complete university guide, they've got their university league tables here. And when you go into their university league tables, you will see this is a generic one. So it's got Cambridge at the top, followed by Oxford, followed by St Andrews. Or you can narrow it down here into subject league tables. I'd always compare uh, one league table with another one. So if you look at the Guardian, um, it uses slightly different measures, slightly different parameters to decide. But theirs goes Cambridge, St Andrews, Oxford, and so on and so forth. But likewise, you can narrow theirs down. Let's say, okay, I know I want to do something within, um, let's have a look, something within education. We get quite a bit doing education. Okay. And then what you've got is you've got suddenly a different rank order of um, universities that are offering within education. So it's worth having a look, and then you can start thinking, well, you might be saying to yourself, well, west of Scotland, that's far too far away. Um, I shan't be going up there, so that narrows that one down and, and, and so on and so forth. So you, you've got quite a lot of universities to look at there. So um, the search process then, I've said, well, look at the subject guide and use those lead tables. There are student reviews and a student website. So um, discoveruni.gov.uk is student satisfaction surveys. And what you can do on this website is you can select universities to compare so what I did when you go through it, for example, I look in communication and media, and I know Bournemouth and Coventry have got quite a good reputation for these courses. So I chose those two, and then you've got the you can look at the student satisfaction surveys for just these universities, or you can look at after the course what do students do. So here, for example, one university has an average salary of twenty thousand pounds six months after the course. Um, and then as you go further down to people's salary range, 95% go on to work and study. So it's got good employment rates. Some are were, um, doing further study and 5% are unemployed there. Okay, see, so, um, the one on the right-hand side, which is that one, I can't remember now. Uh, the right-hand side, I haven't come to, they haven't supplied all their information because they're, they're, their cohort might be too small. But really useful, I, I think, to have a look at um, student reviews. Virtual open days are really important. Normally around this time, you're driving around the country visiting as many open days as you can take off work. Um, with the open days this year, we're having to go to virtual open days. And again, on this UCAS website, they've listed when all the virtual open days are running. So you can see here, and they go past the ad advertised ones. Um, so for example, Middlesex University have got 14th of May to 9th of July. So you can now have to have a look and see um, when the open days might be, you can visit there. And then also within school, we're gonna offer tutorials, time when we'll get together in small groups in a live meeting with students, and we'll just bounce some ideas and see where we've got to and discuss where you are with plans, as where the students are with plans in live meetings. So we'll still have meetups with tutors and myself as we go through. Now the personal statement is, is one side of A4 that students 
really struggle with and you can be a great help with. The idea of a personal statement is that students sell themselves for their course. And we're all quite modest and we find it hard to sell ourselves. So um, academic achievements is the top priority for universities in a personal statement. But then after that, we've got another paragraph where students can bring in wider skills from employment, so reliability, communication, working with the public, particularly if you're doing health courses, um, any extracurricular showing you know, commitment to teams, whatever it might be. And within the personal statement, if you can help just to filter out some cliches, because sometimes students um, are writing in a cliched way and it should be, be a bit more personal than that. Um, and if you can check for sense of spelling, that again will speed the process up. So share personal statements, that'd be great. It is something that students struggle with, um, just to warn you. Right, on to the next thing. Uh, the deadlines that we're working to, October the 15th, um, anyone interested in medics, dentists, vet, vets, Oxford or Cambridge have to meet the October the 15th deadline, all has to be done. Students can add courses later, but because of interview schedules, um, those particular courses have to be completed by the October the 15th. All other courses are January the 15th, is the university imposed deadlines. And universities say, if you meet January the 15th deadline, you've all got an equal chance of, um, of receiving an offer. Um, but working backwards, we as a school have to check for accuracy, we have to write the reference. So we set a deadline of October half term, that's our school deadline. That gives us time, as I say, to check, to go back to students, say, make these corrections, to go to teachers and ask for the reference and to get things sent off in plenty of time. Uh, interviews tend to start those courses that interview after October half term. So I think the sooner you can get it in, the better. So the students are getting interviews nice and early, um, or auditions as well. They come in um, after the October half term. You won't, students won't necessarily hear back actually until the end of April, May. So there's quite a big gap. But some universities are offering in October, giving their offers in, in October, which is great. Um, if you look at some interim deadlines, as I said, the UCAS application form, most of it will only take an hour. That could be done by the end of June. Personal statements really need to be started by July. They won't be completed by then, probably not until you've decided exactly on the course, which won't happen until the start of September. And then by mid-October, we really need to be down to those five universities that you're deciding because that's when you're submitting your um, UCAS application. That costs £25, £25 by the way, which goes to UCAS. Um, to manage the whole process. So that's where that money goes to. Um, you as signposts, um, I've mentioned all these sources that are on here, um, with the exception of the student room, which is a chat forum for students, some who've gone to university already, some who are considering universities. Um, all those uh, sources of information, that'd be great if you can be signposting your student, just to make sure they're using them and even going through them with them. Right, so that's your role in a nutshell. I hope that's been a little bit of help. So we've got the idea of the search process is something that you can be a massive help in as, as a sounding board, but actually just in going over those notes, keeping things organized, getting to virtual open days, because we can have a tendency of students to be a little bit lazy and not bothering those, and actually to use all those university sources. And then personal statements, again, just keep the process going help them find inspiration and keep encouraging people along the way. So I hope you found this helpful, this 30-minute uh, session helpful. Um, we'll be around for another 10 minutes, 15 minutes if you want to put any more Q&As in there. Um, if there are very personal questions that you want to field, you know, you don't want them to get into the Facebook, then you can, of course, just email and I'll get back to you that way. We don't know when schools are opening. When schools open, Year 12s are in and we can develop this further. But at this point, I really wanted to get you as, as parents informed um, on how we're starting our UCAS process. So just remains me to say thank you for your time. If you're at work, back to work for you lot. If you're at home, put your feet up and watch whatever it is you got on the telly. Continue with your home learning, but thank you for your time. And if we're running any more of these, of course, um, I'll, I'll let you know about those.